Okay. Yes. Okay. That is unmuted. Okay. Should we already check out? We check that. Check one, two. 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 I had to pick up the next slide. I still got some got some dog keys. Some always. I really liked that. Yeah. There was a, you know, it's funny. Somebody um, had brought ring lights on the top of your phone. Oh, Those seriously? went so fast. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I should have saved you one. Well, <laughs> no worries. Really yeah. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. So, appreciate right. everybody finding your way down. You got some extra stuff. Turn it on, but lower the volume. <laughs> right. Check one, two. Check one, two. Check one, two. Check one, two. And then switch, light on, and then no light on. Okay. Perfect. I'm just going to fit your presentation to the screen real quick. The first session was the first session pretty good. Yeah. I only asked because I, I don't know how I should like do I really amp my game up or can I go down a little bit? That's not you. Yeah. You do you. Thank you. All right. So we can get started. Yeah. Awesome. Let me make sure this is on. Okay. That's the microphone. Is that is that too loud or or too uh, too soft? Everybody can hear. It's just right. Okay. I mean, it's it's such a large cavernous room. Um, I want to make sure that everyone can hear. So, well, guys, thank you so much uh, for coming out. Oh, I, I forgot I'm on Zoom as well. So I'm going to stand right here behind you talking virtually and in real life. Uh, so it's exciting. So uh, I want to uh, really thank you for uh, coming on in. we got a bunch of people coming in. All right. Well, no worries. Thanks for coming. It is. Yeah, can you hear it? A little bit more. How about there? Can you hear that now? Not really? Oh. Hmm. Now you got it? Now you got it. Maybe I just needed to jiggle the, the wire. That's clinical innovation right there. When all this fails, just jiggle some wires. That's what I say. Well, thank you so much for letting me come and talk to you guys about, uh, about clinical innovation. Um, really excited to do this. I've never actually given this talk before. Uh, so I made this just for you guys. So you guys will have to give me some good feedback um, and uh, whether or not I should ever use it again. So uh, I'm Matt Anderson. Uh, I'm the clinical innovation director uh, for the Banner Innovation Group uh, at Banner Health. So one of the things I work on is uh, projects that are novel, emerging, and unproven uh, in healthcare. So that's what our group works on. Um, 
We, uh, we have groups that work on pilots. We have groups that work on uh, long-term strategy. Um, and we have a venture arm in our innovation group. Um, and then I'm the clinical component to that. So I get the best job. I get to work with all of those other groups um, and provide some clinical context, including doing some projects of my own. So that's a little bit about what I do right now. Um, you know, for this talk, I really, um, you know, I really don't want to give a prescriptive talk. Um, I don't want to read off of slides. Um, I think about being in the in the audience uh, for some of these talks, and I think about what I like about uh, about talks and what I don't like. So I, I eliminated all the things I don't like about talks. Um, so there's not going to be a lot of reading, no data, no figures, nothing like that. Um, we're just going to talk about lessons learned. Uh, lessons learned uh, about clinical innovation from myself, my own personal experience, colleagues, um, you know, friends, um, people in the community. So um, hopefully my goal for this is that you think of uh, a nugget or something that you can take away, one, one piece of information that you can take away um, that maybe affects what you do um, at your regular work um, back on Monday. So uh, when I think about this, I think one of the best talks I ever, I ever went to several years ago in a, in a pre-pandemic world um, uh, I went to a telehealth conference and I went to a, a talk on telehealth strategy and it was the best talk. And she, this woman, the physician, she, start, she, tarted, um, she started her talk saying, if you're ever in a meeting where there's an agenda item that says telehealth strategy, get up and walk away because you've already <laughs> failed. And uh, I just really, that really just stuck with me and I've, I've never forgotten that. So it was like 2014, 2015, something like that. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's always sort of clouded my, not clouded, but the lens I look through for a lot of things. Um, it's in the sense of, are we solving a problem or did we already find the solution? And so that's what I think about when I think about these things. So when I think about clinical innovation, Two, uh, I think about the wild, wild west, right? There's a lot of things uh, in clinical innovation right now that are um, stretching our limits, they're stretching our boundaries. We're in Arizona, right? So um, uh, I think about the wild west. I also think about my dad when I think about the wild west because he loves Clint Eastwood. Um, so I don't know if you guys love the Clint Eastwood movies. Um, so I grew up watching High Plains Drifter and the outlaw Josie Wales and you know those sort of things. And uh, you know, the classic one obviously is uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So that's what we're going to talk about today is the good, the bad, and the ugly of clinical innovation. So lots of stories, lots of things to share. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to, to uh, raise your hand and we'll talk about them. And then sort of as we're telling these stories, you know, think about is this good? Is this, is this bad? Or is this, um, is this ugly? So just a little bit more about me. Uh, I'm from Indiana originally, um, and I went to IU, Indiana University for medical school. I came out to Arizona to do my residency, did my residency here at, in Arizona at Mayo Clinic. Um, I joined a uh, private practice for a while, owned a private practice um, with a couple other physicians for a while. Uh, it was there that I realized that uh, I didn't know enough about the business of healthcare um, or anything about business at all. Uh, so I went and got a, an executive MBA at ASU here in town. Um, and then I worked for Honor Health for a little while. So absolutely. <laughs> got a fan club already and I like that. So uh, I worked as a physician there. I was a medical director and then uh, associate CMO there for a while. And like I said, now um, I work uh, at Banner Health. So. Yes, we got everybody. I got to get this side of the room. We got to figure out where they work and figure out what we can do there. So, um, so yeah, so when I think about my, my career journey, I, I've always been focused on patients and clinicians, right? That's sort of the lens that I look through. And I've, I've learned lessons along the way for all of these places. And that's how I see clinical innovation. So if you are touching a patient, you know, we have the opportunity to improve clinical innovation, right? We have the opportunity to improve what you do um, and, uh, and uh, how you work. So I was gonna talk about the, uh, the six E's of clinical innovation. And this is my first nugget is that uh, perfect should never get in the way of good. Uh, Cause I really knew I wanted to start with empathy, education and ego. And I couldn't think of three more E's that fit with my topic. Um, so knowing I had to get this to Tina at some point in time, I just went with the end of words. So I went with six E's, three at the beginning, three at the end, right? So uh, we're going to talk about these. Uh, these are sort of the themes for some of our stories today. The first theme uh, is empathy, 
right? I think empathy is one of the most important things about clinical innovation and something that we don't talk enough about. Empathy to me um, is being able to walk in someone else's shoes, right? It's seeing their perspective. It's seeing how they see the world and how they interact, especially in a healthcare system. How do they interact with a healthcare system? So I got, let's see, a couple of pictures here about nurses. So uh, a story about empathy. So last year, uh, March or April, uh, something happened, right? Uh, everything kind of started to shut down. And I'm sure everybody here was working on, on different projects, um, trying to get ramped up uh, for COVID. And one of the things that I was tasked with was uh, I was put in, in a group to lead um, all of our telehealth work at, at Banner. And so we were gonna ramp up very, very quickly, very, 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 uh, at very large scale. Um, our outpatient um, telehealth. We did that. And then we got charged with working on some projects to conserve PPE, right? We wanted to help conserve PPE. We weren't sure how long um, we would, kind of our supplies would last, how long this surge would last in, in April and uh, March yet last year. And uh, vaccine wasn't, uh, you know, was not something we had uh, was available to us at the time. So we had this plan to conserve PPE with technology and, and telehealth. We had this great plan. We were going to take uh, tablets and we we're going to take some cameras and put them into our COVID boards, right? COVID floors, COVID boards. And uh, we would have a little uh, kiosk almost outside of those boards uh, for the physicians, for the hospitalists to see their patients so that they could check on them and they could check on multiple in a row without having to gown up and disrobe afterwards, right? So we could conserve PPE. And so we had that set up, worked on it um, at, uh, at our corporate center and then we started deploying it. And there were a couple of hospitals where no one would use it, right? Absolutely no one would use it. Um, they just refused. And uh, so as the physician on the team, it was my job, I got tasked to go out and find out what was wrong with the technology. What was wrong? What, why, why didn't they want to use it? Why weren't these hospitals um, using the technology? So I went out there, we talked with them, and I said, what's wrong with the technology? What can we fix? What can be better? And they're like, we love the technology. It's great. It's fantastic. It's really fun. They love the cameras inside the room because they could zoom in really close. You could actually measure the pupils, the pupil um, uh, distance uh, with these cameras that was something we had, we had installed. So um, I couldn't quite figure it out. I asked them, well, why, why simply will you not use it? If the technology is great, why not? I said, it's not fair. Uh, it's not fair to our nurses, right? It's not fair to our RNs. And they said, we get to stand outside and, and we get to look at all of our patients and not have to be exposed to patients who are sick with COVID. Um, but our nursing colleagues don't. They still have to gown up. And so we were thinking of it solely from the perspective of PPE. Right? We just wanted to save PPE. We wanted to keep physicians from having to gown up and, and disrobe going into every room. And we didn't think about the whole team. So our physicians on the floor, they had the empathy. They, had, they were walking in people's shoes. They understood the relationship they had with their clinical team. That's why they weren't using it, right? They thought it was a great idea, um, but they wouldn't use it because it wasn't fair. Right. So once we learned that, we were able to change some of our policies, change some of our protocols and got that up and running again. So it was an opportunity for us uh, to employ some empathy. It was a really good lesson to learn uh, about empathy. And it really says that you can put empathy in any step. Right. You can put empathy in any single step um, as you're moving forward uh, with any clinical innovation project. So anybody know what that is right there? No, that's your that's your 24 hour AA chip, right? Yeah, that's your 24 hour AA chip. Um, so you know, if you join AA and you want to be in recovery or NA or CA or any of those, um, you know, you go 24 hours with sobriety and you get that chip. And then you get your two day chip and your I guess the seven day chip and then you have your two week chip and then it goes on. So you know, it really is about dedication and passion. Right, um, and uh, a friend of mine who has had a couple of startups. Um, what he thinks about healthcare startups, he likes to have you know founders and um, investors and uh, advisors and board members and all those sort of things. And he always talks about the lens with which he looks through that is whether or not the people involved are really involved in the mission or um, want something on LinkedIn. Right, they want to have that line on LinkedIn. You know, they want that CV. Do they want to say that they're in a healthcare startup? 
Um, and I think that's really powerful to have a mission, to understand that mission and, and have passion uh, in clinical innovation. So there's a company in town that I, I work with sometimes. They're really great. And they work, they focus solely on um, behavioral health issues, right? So they, they have a sort of digital therapeutic for behavioral health. Um, and the people who are involved in that company, who founded the company, work there, almost all of them have a either personal connection or a family connection to a serious um, mental health disorder, right? Um, they are very passionate about that, and they look for people to work with. They have that empathy because they walked in those shoes of the people trying to receive care or family members trying to, to give care. So it shapes everything that they do, right? Um, so not everything has to be as passionate in clinical innovation as, as, uh, as like trying to get your AA chip, but it definitely does help when you're thinking about champions, when you're thinking about people who can drive uh, innovation. It's the people who um, want to champion, who believe in that mission. Um, so even whatever project you're working on, thinking about the mission, I think is really, really important to knowing, is this a checkbox? Is this a LinkedIn site line? Um, or is this really, really uh, believing in the mission? Uh, one of our E's is education. And um, we, have, we have physicians in the room. Any physicians in the room? We've got one, two. Any uh, NPs, nurse practitioners, PAs, RNs? RNs, there we go. All right, sounds good. So, uh, so in healthcare, clinicians, um, you know, uh, everyone spends a lot of time in education. Right, um, and especially physicians. And physicians can be great um, champions of the work we do in clinical innovation, or they can be a great hindrance. And I think it's important to understand how that uh, shapes how people make decisions. Um, you know, physicians spend a lot of their early lives doing nothing but learning and training. So uh, we go to college, we go to medical school, we go to residency, we go to fellowships, we do all this stuff. That's our early life. It sort of shapes everything, um, everything that we do and can inhibit some of the things that we want to do in clinical innovation because physicians were experts, right? We believe we've been trained, um, NPs, PAs, RNs, because we've been trained in a certain way. And it's sometimes hard to change, can inhibit change. We're naturally um, conservative uh, by nature. And we oftentimes, this may be a shock, we often think we're the smartest people in the room, <laughs> any room, right? Um, and because uh, we are experts, and, and we think that sometimes that expertise applies uh, to everything. Uh, one of my one of the mentors I've had, she has started. She's a physician and has started a couple of healthcare startups. When I first met her, one of her first pieces of advice is said that as you start to get into innovation and in digital health, um, you have to know that no one cares that you're a doctor, right? And I was like. Did I find the wrong mentor? Like that's not <laughs> that's not what I want to hear. But it's actually been fantastic advice for me um, as I've moved through my career. Is that it doesn't really matter. You know, you may have expertise in the hospital room, the OR, and the exam room, um, but there's other people who have a lot of other expertise too that you that you have to work with. And let's see. Oh my God. Oh, that's right. And I wanted to tell you one of the first, one of the first things where I think this inhibited my, uh, uh, my experience in digital health uh, was when I first, the first startup I ever worked with, um, I met through a friend of a friend, uh, a founder here in town who was working at an incubator here in town. And um, they had this really interesting early digital therapeutic. And they showed me, um, gave me a little slide presentation. They took me to this uh, their little office and they're like, hey, we want you to come on board and, and help us. And I was like, yeah. That sounds really cool, but that'd be great. And they were like, we're going to give you some equity. You're going to get some stock. And I was like, yeah, all right, stock. That sounds great. I like that. Um, like I knew what I was talking about. I didn't know. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that they wanted me to do is they wanted me to help validate some of their clinical things, uh, validate some of their clinical work, um, and then also really to introduce them to uh, health systems, to physicians, to physician groups around town. And I started doing that. And um, then we sat down one day uh, at their office. And I said, I, I want to use the digital therapy. I want to use it. Let me use it. Um, you know, we're talking to people. I want to use it. Let, let me use it. I'll use it on my wife and my friends. And they're like, uh, you can't do that. I said, well, why not? Said, well, it doesn't exist yet. We haven't built it. <laughs> and I panicked, right? I absolutely panicked. It's like, ah, this is my first sort of foray into this world. And I'm, I'm out there talking to people, introducing them to, to friends of mine and, and colleagues. 
and, and we don't have it built. Um, so it was just like slideware and I, and I actually panicked and I thought I just actually left the company. I quit right there because I didn't know what I, I didn't really know what I was doing, right? I was pretty, I was pretty naive in that sense. So, you know, understanding um, the conservative nature of people in, in healthcare when you're thinking about clinical innovation, I think is really important knowing where they're at. Um, for a lot of people, you know, if you're a software engineer and you're thinking about a minimally viable product or failing fast or some of the things, those make sense to you, right? It wouldn't be uncommon to try to build something um, after you raise the money, right? After you do the slides, uh, but that doesn't always feel right to a lot of people in healthcare. So um, kind of really have to understand you know, how our educational system has moved us forward and how we think. And then E for ego, um, might be very hard to believe, but you know, physicians and people in healthcare sometimes have egos. Um, we, uh, like I said, we sometimes think we're the smartest person in any room. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, um, this, part of it is that we are, we're experts in a lot of places, right? Um, we um, are experts in those, the hospital rooms, the ORs, the exam rooms, things like that. Uh, but we don't know a lot. Um, and one of the things we don't know a lot about is finance oftentimes, not across the board, but in general, there's a lot of things that we don't know uh, about, about finance and about the business of healthcare. A lot of times we are removed from the actual administration of the business of healthcare. Like you go through med school, um, you go through residence, you're not really thinking about rev cycle, you're not really thinking about billing and coding, you're not really thinking about a lot of the things that we do. Um, and uh, when you start more, as more and more clinicians, NPs, PAs, uh, physicians start moving into employed models, you know, you're never, you're never in that point where you're uh, accountable for the rent or keeping the lights on or your accounts payable and those sort of things. So we continue to be farther and farther removed from the actual uh, business of healthcare. You know, it's a common expression, kind of a cliche that doctors are the worst uh, at business, right? That we're the worst at finance. Um, a personal example from mine, when I was in private practice, you know, I owned a practice with four other physicians. And uh, so we all had an equal stake. And once a month, we would meet as partners, right? One evening, we'd meet as partners. And uh, we had hired, a, our, our accountant had uh, retired, so we hired a new accountant. And so that accountant came in one night and um, kind of walked through our books with us and took a look at what, you know, what the prior accountant had said. And, uh, was very worried about retained earnings on our books, right? Very worried about retained earnings. And we talked for about 90 minutes. And at the end of 90 minutes, none of us, none of the partners still knew what retained earnings were, um, <laughs> what we were going to do about it. And, I, and, and I'm pretty sure our accountant was regretting that, taking us as a client, right? Um, we, we just don't always know those things. And it's really, it's really difficult. Some of that is, is just not things that we know. Um, I think one other thing I wanted to, oh yeah, that's right. Um, so ego, also you have to be able to massage things sometimes. You have to understand where, where some people in healthcare are coming from and know when to, when to walk away in a good way, right? Uh, this is a great story from a friend of mine who had a really interesting, um, an interesting uh, uh, piece of software. And he, he and uh, another software engineer friend had built a piece of AI software um, that they thought would be really good for surgeons. They really thought it could uh, benefit um, you know, surgeons. And they kind of bootstrapped their company and uh, they started making some connections and, and everyone kept pointing them to the direction of this one um, uh, rather uh, popular surgeon uh, in their area. And they said, go talk to this guy. He likes, he likes to invest money. He's like an angel investor. He does a lot of stuff. He's really super popular. He has lots of, lots of offices. So go talk to him. And so they made an appointment with this guy. They showed him what they had, right? And what they'd actually built already. Uh, so they actually had something. They, they had a real software, not just slideware. Um, and he says to them, well, you can give me $400,000 a year and we can, we can do this. He said, and they just bootstrapping this, right? This was not something that they had a whole lot of money. They hadn't even gone through you know, family and friends yet. Um, they said, well, what, what do I get for $400,000? Why are we going to give you that every year? And the doc says, well, you get to say you work with me and that's going to help you out, right? You just get to, you get to say you work with me. 
Um, and they realized then that they didn't want one physician. Right? They didn't want one person. Uh, what they ended up doing um, was kind of going around finding counsels, right? They found different counsels, different specialists, um, different specialty surgeons that, that they could talk to on a regular basis. They got a much more diverse um, set of opinions. They spread around their, they almost did some like a guerrilla marketing that way. And they really built up their product and their name brand a little bit, rather than trying to work with one guy um, and pay him uh, $400,000 a year just to, just to say they work. So, uh, so you have to be able to massage those things and find out people, kind of going back to that mission talk a little bit. And the other, the other uh, story about ego, and this can kind of go both ways, especially when you're talking about innovation um, and uh, investors. So there was a, a local company in town with a new digital therapeutic, and they, they'd come to us um, to see if there was a health system that they could partner with and, and try to launch this new digital therapeutic and they had brought on a new investor, an investor who uh, had retired from the banking industry and uh, really thought his retirement was going to be just working in, in startups. So he was very heavily involved in his very first investment with this digital therapeutic. And so I met with the founder and this investor and we went through what the, what the project was and what the digital therapeutic was. And one of the things we were talking about was a little bit about adoption, right? What would be the adoption rate? How would clinicians adopt this tool? And um, the investor's just kind of getting upset and he's kind of just moving around in the seat and he just doesn't look comfortable. He's huffing and roughing. I said, hey, you know, what, what are you thinking about this adoption stuff? What, what, what are you, what's your thoughts? And he says, you know, when I was CEO, when I told employees what to do, they just did it. So I don't understand why we're talking about adoption rate. And I said, have you ever met a physician? Like, <laughs> it's, not, it's not something that we, we can do. You can't just plop something down that has really been untested. Um, and, and make sure that they um, are using it 100% of the time. There's a little bit more nuance uh, to that. And so being able to, uh, to work on the ego on the other side uh, of healthcare, I think is, is quite important as well. But there's a group of people, I think that people in healthcare um, will put aside their education and put aside their um, ego, and really focus on and, and can really show that empathy. And that's patience, right? I think patients um, are sort of an untapped way to drive clinical innovation. Um, patients oftentimes can bring things that their physicians or their treating clinician has not seen before. You know, in this digital age, people communicate um, outside of uh, the traditional healthcare venues quite a bit. You think about the information that people get from 23andMe, Right? You think about people going to uh, being part of websites like uh, uh, patients like me and that kind of stuff. They're, they're getting a lot of information they're bringing to their physicians that, um, that maybe they wouldn't have known otherwise. And they can actually drive change within industries. And I'll give you a, a very personal example. When I was in, uh, I was in practice full time, I had two patients. They were husband and wife. They were both uh, electrical engineers. Um, and they were great patients of mine. And they knew they had a son. Uh, who had um, type one diabetes. And uh, you know, I think he was on 14, 15 at the time. And one day um, the mom, uh, my patient comes in and she says, you know, our, our pediatrician is retiring and we would love for you to be his doctor. And I was, I'm a family physician by training. So I took care of uh, kids, uh, adults, everybody. And I was really honored. I said, yes, thank you. I would love to do that. That would be fantastic. I would love to like bring him in anytime. We'll do whatever we need to do. And she said, the only issue is um, we want to make sure that you're comfortable with us night scouting. And I had no idea what night scouting was. I'm like, I, I can hike at night. I don't know what that means <laughs> exactly. Um, and I don't know if anybody knows night scouting uh, off the top of their head, but at the time that was where people were hacking um, early continuous glucose monitors and insulin pumps to make their own do-it-yourself pancreas. It's a whole online community of people doing that. Um, and uh, they just said, there's no reason why we shouldn't have this information, right? There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to get access uh, into our continuous glucose monitor um, and our insulin pump. We should be able to connect those things. So they were hacking them themselves. So my two electrical engineers uh, were um, basically hacking into these uh, devices for their teenage son. And they said, you know, our pediatrician just gave us a year's supply of insulin vials and we just took care of it ourselves. 
and I kind of panicked again, right? <laughs> um, I said, I don't, I don't, I don't know about this, uh, but we talked about it. I went and um, did a, a little bit of research on my own and, and then brought them all in as a family and we talked and um, I actually decided to do it. Um, we actually worked with them. We had plans. We, uh, we had, they couldn't find a pediatric endocrinologist in town who would help them with this. Um, and so um, I, I helped them with that. And so we worked on how those algorithms worked. We worked on how those things um, could affect him. We made sure he came in for all his blood tests and anytime anything changed, they called me. Um, so I gave him my cell phone number because I was a little worried. So they said, call me um, whenever you need something. And over time, you can see that this has actually driven a lot of innovation, right? Some of this work in continuous glucose monitoring, um, they're opening up a lot of that software, a lot of that data, things are moving forward. And a lot of it comes from the pressure um, that families and patients with type 1 diabetes had uh, to start pushing this stuff forward. So um, that empathy and patience, using patience to drive clinical innovation, uh, I think is, is really important. So um, I, for me, that was a really important lesson that, that I learned. Um, and I learned about night scouting. So it was really fun. And it has nothing to do with hiking at night. Because that literally was my first thought. I was like, why are they telling me about this hiking at night? Um, so that's, that's about patience. Uh, all right. The next thing I was going to talk about is, is time. I think when it comes to time and clinical innovation, that is really, really super important. Understanding timelines, um, understanding how long things actually take to do um, and what the actual time horizon is, and then being able to communicate um, all of those timelines, I think is supremely important to everyone involved. And time is really about understanding your stakeholders. Right, understanding all of your stakeholders. How long does it take someone to do something and where does it fit in their timeline of priorities? Because you can do clinical innovation, a lot of times people want things fast, right? You worked with uh, a division or a physician or, or someone um, in a health system and they're like, well, we want this done, it should only take six weeks. And you're like, sure, that part only takes six weeks, but there's a lot of other things um, that go on. So people like it done fast. Vendors like things done with speed. Physicians and clinicians love things with speed, um, but it doesn't always, it really doesn't always, uh, it doesn't really always work. So I made a list of, like when I think about a project, this is from my stakeholder analysis that I do for any project. These are the groups I talk to first. Contracting, supply chain, legal, compliance, the actual medical group leadership, billing rev cycle, IT, information security, informatics, the EMR team, and finance. Right. So those are all the groups I look at. And each one of them have committees and subcommittees that you oftentimes um, have to go through. So it may take only six weeks to put a vendor solution in place, but it may take sometimes what feels like a billion years um, to get through all of those. And uh, a very, a very personal story on this one is I'm very passionate about diabetic care. Um, and I had a lot of a lot of patients with diabetes in my practice, and and I really always felt like we underutilized uh, point of care technologies for retinopathy. Right? Um, I think you know point of care screening for retinopathy is is hugely important. And I was working on a project, and um, went through all of those went through all of those steps. Um, had the vendor, had compliance, had contracting, had supply chain, um, had everybody on board. Um, the last. The last big piece, because the images from this vendor went to a cloud, information security took um, forever to evaluate, but finally got it done. And I'm really excited. So we have a pilot site. I'm in the pilot site. We've got the vendor on the phone. I've got the manager. I've got our clinical leader of the office there. I've got an IT member there. And we're going to turn this on. We've got the camera. It's right there. It's going to be great. Um, and we were, we were so excited because it was like 10 o'clock in the morning. We we're going to do this. And we thought, well, in the afternoon, we'd already identified all the patients with diabetes that we we're going to try this out on. It was going to be so fantastic. And I even like planned ahead. So I brought in copies of like some of our IT security evaluation. I brought in printed out emails from people just to make sure that like everybody was 100% on board. I was like 100% sure that it was all going to go smoothly. I just, I wanted it. It had taken forever. Um, and so we're on the phone with the vendor and they say, okay, we got the, got the camera out of the package, sitting there on, on a table. I said, all right, turn it on. So we turned it on, right? That was great. And then the first, the first step after turning it on was hook it up to the Wi-Fi, to the wireless internet. 
We're like, okay, there's all these options. Like everything always pops up. There's like a million different letters. And I said, which one? I turned to our IT guy and I said, um, which one of these do I choose? And he said, oh, did you get your authority to join the wireless? <laughs> and I'm like, yep, I got all these pages. Like here's information security, here's this, here's that. He's like, oh yeah, but you need this like form X, Y, Z because you need permission to join the wireless. And you can't use the guest network because it has PHI. So um, we can't hook this up. And I, 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 th I thought I might fly actually. Because <laughs> <So, laughs> uh, it's been a long time. And so, um, you know, uh, it was very crazy. And even the vendor said, you, we always have problems because none of these, these launches ever go perfectly, but usually we get past the Wi-Fi step. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, so, you know, timelines and understanding stakeholders and it never occurred to any of us that the um, information security and the IT technology teams um, were different than the team that took care of the wireless internet. It never occurred to us. So um, understanding, going deep into stakeholders, understanding the timing uh, of everything, I think is, is uh, supremely important. And then I have this uh, ultrasound wand up on the screen. Um, you know, I, one of the things I've been really interested in recently is handheld point of care ultrasound. I don't know if anybody's ever used a portable handheld, there we go, ultrasound. I, I think it's fascinating. Um, and, and I love the idea uh, of it. And, and you're gonna see a lot more of it, I think, moving forward. Um, and I'm in the middle of a project right now. Uh, so we have, a, we have a pilot going um, with uh, point of care ultrasound handheld. It's really exciting, it's going really well, but um, timelines uh, were really important on this because we knew it would take a while to get everything approved um, for, and we were looking in one specific division, right? We were looking at one specific group of clinicians. And we made sure that we reached every single clinician who was potentially going to be using this. We wanted to make sure everyone knew about it, that everyone was 100% on board. And uh, we just wanted to make sure all of those stakeholders were there. And it was really good, too, because this project took so long to launch that the first uh, clinician lead for that division left. Um, and so... Well, we, had, we talked to everybody, so we got the next person up. Um, so that next person uh, came up, and so that doc became the sort of the champion for this program as we were still trying to get through it. Um, and then he left. <laughs> so we're on our third leader for this group um, in trying to get this up. But it's actually running up now. It's, it's actually up and running, so it's pretty exciting. Um, so, you know, being able to understand those timelines, understand the horizons, making sure that all of your stakeholders uh, are completely on board um, with everything is really super important. So, check my time. How am I doing time? Okay, perfect. Um, one of our E's is finance. Uh, I've already mentioned that, you know, as clinicians, we're oftentimes not really great at finance. I think understanding the finance of all clinical innovation is really important. Um, for the clinicians in the room, you know, when you think about um, injuries and you think about pain uh, for uh, joints, you know, oftentimes if you have knee pain, um, when you're training and, and when you're in practice, you think about, not only do you think about that specific joint, you think about that, that joint that hurts. So say you have knee pain, you might want to get a picture of the knee, uh, but then you probably want to also want to get a picture of the joint above, right? You want to get a picture of the hip and you want to get a picture of the foot, right? So you get the joint above and below. And I think that where that applies to uh, finance is that you have to really understand not only your solution, not only what you're trying to um, uh, install or, or implement, but you have to think about what are the upstream and downstream effects, right? Really what's going to happen? Because you may have a great solution for um, knee pain, essentially, but it might actually not be the knee. It might be the hip, it might be the foot, right? So from a clinical standpoint, that's how we think. And I kind of have to apply that um, to clinical innovation. One of, uh, one of the uh, early digital therapeutics I knew one of the guys who uh, was one of the salespeople from the early digital therapeutics that did a lot of remote patient monitoring. Um, and they would go into health systems and they'd say, hey, we're going to, um, we're going to uh, uh, figure out how to uh, make your docs more efficient. We're gonna get your endocrinologist more efficient. We're gonna take care of your patients better. We're just gonna implement this digital therapeutic. And the uh, administration of these health systems used to always say, well, that's great, let's do it. And then they'd bring it to their endocrinology teams and then they would all revolt. <laughs> and he was very, uh, 
he, he was very upset that he was getting all these uh, sales calls with endocrinologists teams that just refused to use it, right? And they were very worried that that was going to decrease some of their, um, their productivity, it was going to decrease some of their revenue, and it was going to take away from their patient experience. So that, that downstream effect um, was limiting their ability to implement anything at all. One project that actually um, I started earlier this year, um, we were working with a company that had an automated tool uh, for doing some administrative work for clinicians, right? It's an administrative tool um, to just you know, make things a little bit faster for the clinicians when it came to some paperwork burden. And it looked really good. And the first couple of meetings we had with them um, were great. And then uh, we actually decided, kind of thinking about that empathy component, we actually went to their site um, and, uh, uh, we start talking to all the other people involved in this process. And uh, one of the things that we learned was that while this solution was great for physicians and great for the clinicians involved, it actually caused more problems before and after, <laughs> right? So our, um, our registering staff and some of our front office staff would have to actually do more work, go into more websites, um, remember more passwords. Um, and uh, the billing and revenue cycle team actually caused more work for them. So as we were thinking about it, from a holistic standpoint, it didn't make any sense for our, our system at all. Um, it made sense for that one specific slice of people in the healthcare system, but not for everybody. And so we decided to pass. We actually shut the program down um, before implementing it because it just didn't make sense to us overall. And then I think I'm getting to my last slide. I think I'm just about out of time. So those are my good and the bad and the ugly stories. And hopefully they all seem pretty obvious whether they were good or bad or ugly. Um, the uh, retinopathy camera is definitely my ugly story because I seriously almost cried when that happened. So, um, but think about the future of clinical innovation. This is just my, my peek into the future and, and my own personal thoughts uh, about this. Um, you know, I think the future of clinical innovation um, is about augmenting things. It's about augmenting our experience. Uh, it's about augmenting the ability to be a force multiplier, right? How can we take um, the same clinicians, the same teams, the same staff, uh, and allow them to have a greater impact, right? How can we do that? Um, and how can we augment that and how we monitor things? You know, we think about the touch points that patients have throughout um, their healthcare journey. Most of it is not in a hospital, not in, a, in an OR, not in an ASC, not in a rehab facility. It's, it's at home. It's where they work. It's other places. So how can we monitor that, uh, augment our ability to make it actionable? Um, how can we make that actionable what we're monitoring? Not just the monitoring for the sake of monitoring isn't going to be great, but can we be actionable in how we do that? Um, how do we create fail-safes? You know, how can we use clinical innovation and technology to make sure that the care we're giving today is actually the right care for the right person, right? How can we, again, create some of those fail-safes? How can we create um, uh, the breaks when something happens that's sort of in the background that allows us to continue to work but catches up some of the mistakes we make? And then how do we enhance, right? How do we enhance, um, how do we make sure that the the clinical innovations are enhancing the patient experience, enhancing the clinician experience, um, not just thinking about revenue, thinking about new lines of business or anything like that. How do we enhance this and make it better? So that's my, that's my uh, peek into the future. Uh, so Clint Eastwood and I, thank you very much uh, for, for coming. I hope it was enjoyable and uh, I hope there was at least one nugget that, that you took out of this. So uh, hopefully we have a little time for questions. I didn't go too far over. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. I have one question. Do you think that when you're in medicine, the doctor sees other patients? Do you have a capacity in pregnancy? Oh. That yeah, for the for the people on Zoom, the question is: In medical school, should you receive classes on finance? Um, yeah, I think you should. Um, <laughs> I do, um, because you know it's a uh, it's um, I'm a first generation physician, right? Um, I, I'm actually you know some 
one of the first people in my family's uh, to go to college. So um, there's a lot of things that I just didn't know about life in general. Um, and I think there's so much about um, the business of healthcare that just is shielded from us. You know, um, I think it's shielded from people who work there. And I think the more we know about the system, the more we have the ability to change things. Um, and you know, I don't know that the classic fee-for-service world um, is going to be around forever in the same manner it is right now. It, it's always going to be around some way, but um, it's it's not going to be around in the same way. So I think we still have to understand um, the healthcare system. So uh, I think we need to be able to be um, at least conversational in accounting. You know, I think we need to be able to have some of the that language that we can share um, and, and know and have that that discussion. I think. One of the benefits of things that I've done in, in my job is I, I get to be able to be a conduit sometimes between um, people who really understand the, the healthcare administration and the healthcare business and the clinicians who actually do the frontline jobs. And um, I think the more we break down that barrier, um, the better off we're gonna be. So we really understand um, what we're doing and the impact it has. So yeah, I think it should definitely be at least part of training. Right. So whether you're talking about school or um, on the job training um, or if it's through, um, you know, just just interests. Um, but I think it should definitely be encouraged 100 um, percent. My second question is also related to technology and information. Do you think that there has to be improved as well as in your training class and at school that you understand more about what is innovation and your practice? Um, I don't know if it should be required. The question was, should in, in the same way of finance, um, should uh, innovation be taught um, clinically? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know if that has to be there because not everyone has that interest, right? Not everyone has that interest. Sometimes, you know, you, you want to be able to um, focus on the work that you do. You want to, if you're a RN, you want to do RN work. And if you're a physician, you want to do physician work. And so not everybody wants to Put that, put that effort in or, or has that interest. So I don't think we have to do that, um, but I think we definitely need more opportunities uh, to do that. I think more people need to take a, a few more risks. Um, I think you know, if you're interested, we need more avenues for people to get involved in startups, um, to understand that world, um, more opportunities to converse and talk. Um, you know, uh, I've, I've done a lot of work this year. I've kind of been focusing on artificial intelligence in medicine. I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. There's actually a great, um, a great group called AI Med, um, and they put on a course. Uh, they do a, they call it a board certification. Um, they do a board certification in artificial intelligence in medicine. It's fascinating, um, and it has really opened my eyes to a lot of things that are there. So I think the more opportunities that people have, um, we should foster that interest. So if you're mentoring someone, if there's people on your team, I think that's the most important thing. I may not care at all about innovation in, I, I don't know, uh, ENT, um, but um, if I know someone who does, I should be able to encourage that. There's things that apply across the board no matter what. So I think mentorship and sponsorship um, and, and opportunities, I think, are really important. Is that question on prioritization? So we get a lot of innovations. You guys have some way of prioritizing that work? Uh, so the question is, how do you prioritize clinical innovation, especially in a giant health system um, like ours? Uh, uh, I'll, I'll go back to my, my six E's of innovation. Um, perfect should not get in the way of good. <laughs> and so we do it the best we can at, at, at this point. So there are certain themes. Um, so when we think about products in our own, our own innovation group, um, there's sort of two ways that we get ideas and projects. Um, one is that we think about the landscape and we find things that we think uh, can have impact. And so we, um, we meet with a lot of, because of our venture fund as well, we meet with lots and lots of companies. So we see a pretty steady um, uh, uh, flow of new companies and new technologies. And so we see those and we see something that we really think is interesting. That's where our, that, um, 
that one uh, company that for the physicians and their, their automation came from, um, we saw that as a VC pitch and we thought it could be applicable. So we pull some of those things in. The other thing that happens is that it gets kind of pushed to us uh, from other parts of the organization. So if someone has a problem they want to solve or there's, a, there's sort of a theme or an initiative um, to work on. So um, we have worked on uh, projects. Well, you know, last year was a little bit about COVID. Um, so <laughs> we did some work um, there um, and that was sort of our, our, we did work on PPE, we did work on masking, we did work on, um, on uh, sanitizing masks and those sort of things. We tested a lot of masks, um, different N95 things. Um, we, this year, uh, going into next year, uh, our chief clinical officer has asked us to think about diabetes. Um, and how diabetes works. And so um, that gives us the leeway to kind of find our own path through that. Um, but uh, the, the theme came from above. So we kind of go from below and from above to find our ideas. And then um, we prioritize them based on impact. Like how many, how many clinicians, how many frontline staff can we touch? Um, how many patients can we touch? Um, if it's, uh, if it's going to, be sustaining too, because there is a finance component to all this innovation stuff. And it, it didn't mention that specifically, but can it be sustaining, right? Can this sustain outside of a early pilot or you know something that is, is funded through our innovation group? Can it sustain itself? It might not. And that might mean that there's something that competes with that, that uh, for resources. There's a limited number of resources, uh, both time, energy, um, you know, sponsors, uh, money. Um, so we have to kind of prioritize things that way. So it's not perfect. Um, so it's always as good as we can make it. Two minutes, two minutes. Yeah. Hi. Um, just to follow up with like you said, just wonder, do you share your innovation out with other innovation groups? Um, you know, I've worked with several healthcare systems. They all have a, an innovation branch. Is there some kind of networking that happens between those two groups? Yeah. Absolutely. I think the question for those online was about um, innovation groups uh, connecting um, and sharing uh, sort of best practices and ideas and all those things. And I think there's a lot of that. I mean, a lot of there's a lot of um, uh, uh, ways that we connect. A lot of it is through investments. So it's a lot of through in VC groups. So so many health systems right now um, have their own funds that they're working on. So um, doing early stage funding. And so we work with a lot of other health systems that way. So we'll share um, some of the investments that we're working on. Um, and for us, we only invest in companies that um, we're already working with. Um, so we think that that technology or that program or whatever it is, um, is good enough to touch our patients and then, then we invest. So um, we, we work a lot in that, in that venture world uh, with other health systems that way. Um, and then it's just, you know, networking. Right? It's like being in places like this and meeting people and then connecting. So um, outside of anything formal in clinical innovation, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, but uh, that's a good question. But a lot of it is just connections, personal connections, and then our venture group. I'm sorry, it's so hard to unmute. Um, I'm Maybe it, maybe two o'clock. This, this conversation of the culture of innovation weaves in so well and complements our hospital at home discussion. So we hope to see all of you there this afternoon. That's at two o'clock today. Um, and we have 10 minutes in between sessions. So are there, would anybody like me to share the rooms for the track sessions and where to go back to the helpful for everybody? Track one, Joshua Tree. Track two, Dolores. Track three Bruce, is Bruce, actually in Capistrano. Uh, I just tried to work for Sherry. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, East. Oh, okay. This track four. You might think that's a new and new startup, but we've got oh, a lot of things on. Using it as a visual Focus on the emergency department. Oh, interesting. How they play our security index, ESI. Yep. So the twos and the threes are not always easy to get. Right. So we've got a tool that lays in right. 
So we so we share all the time. Would you be interested in the study that we should be yeah, just, there you go. Our investors just talked to somebody at Vanderbilt just fully coincidental, and then I looked at the agenda today. And said, oh my gosh, that's a big one. Yeah, see there. I should probably go to that. Cool. Thank you. So it should be around. We're just gonna say hi. We're all from Vanderbilt. So I'm not. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And I think I'm ready for team.
confirm.
All right. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. And then you said that there's like we unmute or is it? Oh, it's unmuted already. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you guys for attending this session. So really excited. I know both Andrew and I are happy to be here and to um, talk a little bit about um, social determinants of health in, in particular. So before we do that, just to introduce myself, I'm Chad Gary. I'm the Chief Operating Officer with um, Mercy Care Plan. I'll talk a little bit about Mercy Care Plan in a moment, just in case um, you guys are not aware of our um, local health plan. But with that, I'll turn it over to Andrew to introduce you. Hi, everybody. My name is Andrew Tarek, and I am the Director of Social Determinants of Health for Health Current. I don't, I don't have a microphone, so I'm going to project very loudly. If you can't hear me on the uh, Zoom, just let us know. Yeah, and I don't have mine on, so, but, but I've been, uh, people have yelled at me for not having an inside voice, and I'm, they're like, whisper, and I'm like, I am whispering, and they're like, oh, okay, I don't know what's wrong. So, anyways, if you can't, I'll turn on the microphone and, um, and kind of uh, go from there. So um, with that, just for today's agenda, wanted to talk a little bit about social determinants of health in general, um, talk about some of the regulators that are out there that are really focusing on social determinants of health to give a bit of a more bird's eye view into kind of both on the federal side, but here locally with the state, um, focus on social determinants. Another piece that I know for Mercy Care, um, wanna talk a bit about um, the use of Z codes and the importance around um, Z codes as well. And then just kind of priorities moving forward. And then um, Andrew's gonna um, talk a bit about um, something that I think many of us are super, super excited and he has the opportunity to implement this, which is what's called the closed loop referral system. And so um, spend a, a bit of time actually talking about that because I think it's something that here in the state of Arizona, we definitely should be very proud of that we're actually able to do something um, as he's working on. So with that, so um, just a bit, um, when I say Mercy Care, um, some folks know Mercy Care, some folks don't. It's kind of a complicated thing. And so I will at times get a lot of questions about, well, who is Mercy Care? So um, Mercy Care actually is a um, local nonprofit um, community-based health plan. Um, it's actually owned by a few different entities, um, Dignity Health. So some of you might know Dignity, they're a little large health system here, particularly here in Arizona, um, and then Ascension Health. So they're actually the owners of the plan. Um, and then they pay another organization to actually run the plan. That's where the complication comes in. Um, and that um, other entity is Aetna, CBS Aetna. So I'm actually, even though I'm the chief operating officer for Mercy Care, I'm actually an Aetna CBS employee. So um, we have a bit of the best of both worlds. Um, we get to tap into a really large organization when it comes to technology and resources, and that's the CBS Aetna world. But I also get to work for a nonprofit and really be extremely mission focused and community based and focused on a lot of the local initiatives that need to happen here in Arizona. So Mercy Care has um, a few what we call lines of business, but there are various different populations that were, we have the opportunity to um, help um, and cover their insurance needs for. Um, so we have the Access Complete Care, which is the bulk of the work that, or the bulk of the population, we have over 300,000 300, um, lives that we cover under that. We also um, um, have the opportunity to work with individuals within the Arizona long-term care system. Um, also, we have a Medicare Advantage plan, which is a special needs plan. We're working with also uh, individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, we're also the Regional Behavioral Health Authority. Um, here um, in this county, 
Um, so working with adults with serious mental illness, um, we have the opportunity to oversee the public um, behavioral health crisis system here in the county um, and a range of other things as, as what we call the REBA. And last but not least, um, just recently, we were awarded a contract to cover all the physical and behavioral health um, services for children in the child welfare system. So why I'm speaking to these populations is because when we talk about social determinants of health and you start thinking about these unique populations and how social determinants of health play out for each of these um, um, groups of individuals, it may take on a different nuance there. And so I'll give some examples as we move, move forward. So, so with that, I'm feeling like many people now know social determinants of health, but the second I do that is the second people raise their hand and say, wait, what is social determinant? So I've decided to never make assumptions. Um, you guys can throw tomatoes if you guys are like the state experts in social determinants, which maybe some of you are. Um, but I'll, I'll give a little bit of how I understand it because that's the other thing. There's various different definitions and understandings out there. But really when we talk about social determinants of health, thinking about um, what are those social factors out there that um, that really impact all of us um, at some point in our lives. Um, so thinking about housing, um, having housing security, you know, do, do you have a place to call your own to sleep at night? Is that a secured setting, meaning that you expect to be there the next day? Um, so the housing component of it, food security. So meaning, um, do you know where you're going to get your food each and every day? Do you feel like there's a possibility you may not be able to get food um, the next day or for your children? And um, so food security, financial health is another aspect of it. Um, education and employment, those are all factors um, that social factors that may impact us. Well, the interesting thing about those social factors our research has actually shown that those social factors really um, impact someone's health, sometimes more than the actual um, uh, disabilities that they may have, like diabetes or those, those types of conditions, that, that those social factors actually play out in a person's overall health in a far greater way than probably ever was understood previously. And so there's been some statistics that suggest those social factors impact our health, 80, impact 80% 80 of our health, and it's the 20% that um, is more the traditional understanding of, of what's actually creating health for individuals. So social factors really play a huge role in how healthy someone is. And so because of that, a lot of folks such as myself in the health insurance world, you would think I'm more worried about claims and, you know, things that typically insurance companies do, you know, prior authorization and whatnot. Although that's a really important aspect of the work that we do, we recognize now that, you know, how we need to be focused on housing, we need to be focused on social um, factors, um, including food insecurity and whatnot. So, so that's why we're coming here today to talk a bit of how do we operationalize um, some of that work moving forward. So I did want to point out that, um, from the federal side, the um, CMS, as I'm sure all of you guys know CMS, um, uh, is really also highlighting the need for health plans and providers um, out there to focus on social determinants. So um, they had recently, not too long ago, um, issued what they called the new roadmap for states to address social determinants of health for Medicaid and CHIP populations. And so pretty lengthy document, but they actually are giving the states a lot of um, room to really address the social factors. So they actually gave um, specific guidance on how can you potentially address housing insecurity? How can you potentially address um, food insecurity? And so they gave, it was actually a pretty great document that, that I think really helped support states' efforts to address um, the social factors or social determinants of health. Um, the other one is um, that I'll also, well, and then within the, the guidance, you know, there's, I have up here just kind of the range of guidance that they, they gave. But the other one that I wanted to spend a bit of time is really 
the state um, focus here on social determinants. So access, which is our state Medicaid system here in Arizona, um, has what they call a, the whole person initiative. And that's their efforts um, to really look at those social factors from an Arizona lens and to say, hey, what do we need to be doing? What are our focus um, around these really, really critical issues? And so they have a few different priorities that they've started out with. Um, those priorities definitely will evolve as time goes on, um, but they're looking at housing, um, in particular transitional housing. So getting people into some sort of housing as quickly as possible, that might not be the kind of end game for an individual. They might, you know, there might be another step, but getting them into some level of transitional housing um, non-medical transportation, so transportation to, you know, things like job interviews or grocery store, um, some, some transportation that will really address some of those social factors. Um, luckily here in Arizona, we actually have significant um, coverage of medical transportation. Some states actually don't have that, um, but we do have um, medical transportation to get to primary care appointments, to get to specialty appointments, to get to mental health appointments. Um, so that's great here in Arizona. It's to get to transportation to get to some of those other, like the grocery store we don't really have at this point. So they're looking at that as, as an opportunity. Social isolation um, research has really showed how much social isolation can play out in the health of, of all of us. Um, this has definitely been exacerbated with the pandemic that we've been living in and, and definitely there's been a range of articles that really talked about how we're all struggling um, with isolation and, and what does that mean to all of us. And so, um, so social isolation is a priority for access as well. Um, and then the other piece, which I keep pointing to Andrew, <laughs> another priority is the closed loop um, referral system, which again, we're all excited about and he'll, he'll talk a bit about. Um, but that's as a, that closed loop referral system is a part of their whole person initiative as well. So, um, so when we talk about the social factors and then fast forward to at the provider level, um, how do we capture those social factors? And so y'all, many of you, are probably aware of, you know, ICD-10, um, that alone, I know all of you are aware of that, um, but the Z, there are Z codes in there and Z codes um, as a part of ICD-10 are really a way to capture social factors that are impacting um, patients or members. Um, those um, uh, social factors, you know, they have a code for homelessness, they have a code for um, food insecurity, they call it lack of adequate food and safe drinking water. Um, so there's a range of various different codes um, that really get at that those social factors. So those Z codes moving forward, when we think about our work as a community, as a state, um, as a nation, that those Z codes are going to be and are starting to be very, very critical because that is our way to capture what is going on with people in a more objective and quantifiable way. Um, in the past, it's been much more anecdotal. Um, I know at the insurance level, we have nurses that capture it in various different ways. Um, but when we think about our providers, which are doing the bulk of the work, how are they capturing that? And so the Z codes are really one way that we're um, definitely focusing our energies around. And so, um, so as Mercy Care, we're really suggesting to providers, please, please, please start using Z codes. And so we're almost having at this point a call to action because we really, really need um, those Z codes captured on um, the claims, um, in particular those diagnoses. Z codes typically are not a primary diagnosis. So you would still have like diabetes, but then you'd have like a Z code um, after that, that related to maybe homelessness. Um, homelessness impacts diabetes significantly um, and, and also impacts what treatment you may actually end up um, being able to provide to someone with, with diabetes, for example. So those Z codes are very, very important in the work um, moving forward. 
And so, as I noted, um, as I noted, we have a whole initiative, um, not only around social determinants of health at Mercy, but around Z code usage and really trying to encourage providers to um, leverage those Z codes. Now with that, you're not just going in and you know, putting a bunch of Z codes on the claim. Um, obviously the um, you know, physicians and nurses uh, need to screen for um, Z for these conditions and that hasn't always been done. So asking specific questions, you know, where do you plan to, you know, lay your head tonight? Or, you know, are it, do you have a grocery store, you know, a mile, at least a mile away? So um, there's specific screening that really should be done and really encouraging providers to screen, to leverage. And there's evidence-based screening tools. One of the tools that will likely be really, really encouraging is what's called PAR, um, which is an evidence-based Research has been done around this, but to leverage that um, screening tool to, you know, ask some of those specific questions um, so that you can then start looking at, um, okay, this person is homeless, they have diabetes, what are we going to do, you know, what are we going to do. Um, and so that's a really important aspect of this work. And so like I said, this is a bit of a call to action, we really need those Z codes both at the patient level or member level, but then as someone like Mercy Care, what we're going to be doing is taking that data and looking at what does the population look like? What are the needs across the population? And we have opportunities either through our own mechanisms or through strong collaboration with partners such as the Department, Arizona Department of Housing or other coalition groups to say, hey, here's what we're seeing the need. Is there an opportunity to collaborate? But we really need data to be able to do that kind of work. And so that's why we're leaning um, pretty heavily moving forward on Z codes. Um, but when we look at the data now, we see some providers are doing an excellent job. It's, it's interesting behavioral health providers um, seem to have jumped on the, the Z code train some time ago. Um, the physical health provider like primary care, some of the specialties haven't as much got there just yet. Um, and, but you know, still there's work on the behavioral health side, there's work on the um, physical health side still to do around, around Z code. So with that, as we say, you know, start screening for, for these social factors, please start using Z codes. We're saying that, but we want to, as an organization, really support providers work around that. And so part of this initiative um, is we've designed um, provider specific reports to help providers track their utilization of the Z code. So, you know, you guys are doing the claims, you're submitting them, um, you know, the, the providers. Um, so they have a sense of it, but we're giving in a very um, easy, easy readable way, um, these reports that really highlight that Z code utilization and it tracks time over time. Um, we put in the report, the ability to look at it by zip code. We put in there the ability to really capture race and ethnicity and look at it from that vantage point as well. So that providers have an opportunity within their world to kind of see slice and dice the data and see wow, I'm seeing food insecurity as a big component of the patients that I'm seeing. Maybe I need to think about doing some partnerships or something or going to Mercy and seeing if there's an opportunity to do a combined partnership for this particular zip code or this particular um, racial group. And so, so that is part of the reports that we've um, designed to really help providers um, look at the data for their population in particular. Um, as I noted, the screening is a really big part of it. We will be um, rolling out um, additional training and support around screen screening for social factors. So we'll have um, some of that feature forward to um, occur. Um, but then also a big part of screening using Z codes, all of this, and then um, connecting people to the resources is the workflows, the provider workflows. So we understand that that sometimes is a really big lift for certain providers, 
definitely depending on the size. It could be it could be a huge lift if you're a big provider. It could be a huge lift if you're a smaller provider. So understanding those workflows are really important, and we definitely want to be um, walking side by side on the provider's journey towards doing that and be seen as a resource and a support. So we'll be also deploying some efforts around um, that as well. And then ultimately, like I said, with with um, Health Current's work on the closed loop, helping to support providers' efforts to get connected to that referral system, um, but also to um, uh, leverage that as a part of their workflows and, and um, adopting that. So we definitely, um, in our efforts around addressing social determinants, really want to partner with providers, with um, other organizations to really do this in a very, very meaningful way. This isn't about checking the boxes, this is about changing lives and really addressing the needs of the community. So we wanna be thoughtful in doing that. And so that's what really this initiative is. That's why I said it's beyond just the Z code. Like we could say, okay, like let's just see the Z codes go, you know, sky high, everyone's collecting, but it's really about what do we do after that? That is really important and really look forward to those collaborative um, partnerships to, to address that moving forward. And that gets to kind of some of the work that, that we really have done as we have seen lacking Z codes, but we have other ways that we've um, seen the need for patients out there when it comes to housing and food insecurity. Um, we've done some pretty th things that I'm so proud of um, we've been able to do, which is really partner with, like the Department of Housing, partner with certain municipalities such as the city of Phoenix to say, hey, we're seeing this issue. If we're able to you know, collaborate with you guys to, we'll put some funding in, you guys put some, you know, can we make a difference in this? And surprisingly, those conversations are not really that hard to have, um, especially when you have data and you're coming with the best of intentions to really make a difference. Um, people usually want to come to the table and do that. And so as Mercy with this whole initiative, we really see us continuing to evolve those um, uh, collaborative um, partnerships to do something better. And so really engaging with providers and other community organizations to rally around this. And so that's really what the initiative ultimately is about. Um, look, yeah, yeah, definitely. One of the disparities is disparities in health is actually right now. Are you doing anything? Yeah, no, it's a, yeah, in fact, I, I love the fact that you brought that up because we were seeing that that was a big issue. Yeah, especially during the pandemic, but even moving yeah. forward, right? Um, and so there is, um, there's definitely some organizations, uh, it was just two weeks ago that I was actually starting to kind of nestle more down into that and looking at where are um, our gaps when it comes to you know some of these other factors and the digital component is a huge issue. Um, there are some great organizations out there that are doing some work around um, that in particular, um, such as um, working collaboratively with um, local libraries and um, other organ schools is another one and trying to leverage the Wi-Fi connectivity through those organizations. Um, and creating, so I, I'll be honest, I didn't even know there's digital navigators or what they're called. And it's people that help other individuals get connected to um, the digital, you know, kind of um, digital opportunities that might be out there. So um, I'm actually really happy you brought that up because that just further solidifies the work that we need to be doing, particularly around that. And when you think of telehealth, especially with the pandemic, telehealth has just blown up. I know for our Mercy members, when we look at our utilization of telehealth, it's grown exponentially actually. Um, but there are definitely individuals that are not able to leverage that as a, as a resource. When you think of rural folks in the rural areas and, and whatnot, but even here um, in the county, there are um, you know definitely some um, digital deserts or however you want to call it. And so um, that is definitely a, a really, really important aspect of that. Yeah, I don't want to be like, like baby was born with an iPad. I was coming out of the womb. Right. And you have baby boomers. 
Exactly. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that right. The younger folks, I know my unfortunately my five year old uh, nephew knows how to be on the phone, and I would be calling his, his mom as my sister. So I try to get a hold of her. He's busy watching dinosaurs on YouTube and figured out how to decline calls. So I'm like, why is she like always hanging up on me? Like, what is going on? Well, then I found out it was Jacob, my nephew, that was like decline, decline. I'm like, okay, whatever. I, I don't know how I should take that. Um, but Tinder, right? Exactly. <laughs> Too funny. Yep, yep. So, anyways, I want to make sure that I'm giving um, Andrew enough time to talk, and then um, for any questions. Uh, yep, and then. I can answer you. Um, one of my last subjects is when I teach telecommunication design and integration. And Founding Public Informatics, and we were working with a map on data for the time as well before the pandemic hit. And my students asked, we have any student data that we want to work with? Because they, they want to talk about social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. My job is to teach them student data. Is there any data available that we can consider to teach our students how to tackle these problems? You know, there's a range of data out there, not to give you a big, but I mean, you can, and I'll give you my card, but. There's a range of different organizations that have um, have data sources that they pull from. Even I, I would imagine Andrew has some ideas too about that. But but there are a various different range um, of organizations that um, allow for public use of, of the data that get to some of these social determinants factors. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Uh, I came to the behavioral health because of my sister and my son. I was in chemistry and I came to this because of my sister and all the good work that we've done. Yeah. And I became an advocate for autism and became behavioral health because of that. And I became a professor in teleinformatics. And that's my job is to empower patients and yeah. providers and help people. And that's one of my jobs is just to yeah. get them. Out that we need to improve right social yeah um asu and we can talk a little bit more about this offline but asu actually is kind of an aggregator of data public data I know. um so they have actually a lot of our data um that you know they're um you know and and i know that's probably another area but we could definitely talk a little bit about that as yeah. well because there's i think great opportunity even when i've sat with um those individuals at issue, I'm like blown away. I'm like, what? You could do what? This is great. Yeah. So, um, so there's, I think, a lot of different opportunities for sure with helping your students um, rally around um, this in particular. So it's great to, and it's great to hear that you're, you know, supporting those students and really um, thinking about this um, moving forward, particularly from a health perspective. Yeah, so. We are using it. They have to think. The last word was speak to me data of CMS with in your state and think what are the areas of desert of care in your state where you can most use CMS data, what, what is using that data. Interesting. Wow, fascinating. Very, yeah. very cool. Yeah. Any other questions? I know we'll we'll save some time too at the end as well. Um, but I know you'll definitely have questions for this gentleman. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Ted. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Tarek. I, so I'm, I'm the director of social terms of health with Health Current. Um, if you're not familiar with who Health Current is, we are uh, we are also a nonprofit organization. We are the only health information exchange here in Arizona. Uh, and some big news uh, you may have seen recently: we merged with an organization in Colorado called Coreo, and we will soon be called Context. Or we are called Contexture, but we're Health Current and Contexture still at the same time. <laughs> So um, I'm going to just be talking about this really great initiative that we're working on uh, that is separate from the Health Information Exchange, and it is this closed loop referral system. Um, so first, just talking about the partnerships of who is putting this all together. So Health Current has partnered with Access and Solari, uh, Crisis and Human Services, uh, and 211 Arizona. So Solari operates uh, 211 Arizona here in Maricopa. Uh, and so Access is supporting this financially, so the system is completely free. Uh, no aspect of the system has any cost to anyone who wants to adopt it. 
Um, and our partnership with Solari, uh, they're actually currently working on uploading all of their healthy human services to our system. So day one, which actually is today, October 1 is today is officially uh, going wide today. So that's really exciting, yes. Um, and from day one, we already have uh, nearly 10,000 services on there and over, I think, 2,000 organizations uh, on the system for sharing resources already. Uh, and we're working on just bringing on our early adopters uh, now. Um, and our other partner on here is the NowPow, is NowPow. And so NowPow is the name of the platform that will host it. And we do have a name for the system, um, but I think that's gonna be revealed. It, it might've been revealed in an email today, but I think we're gonna do a bigger reveal at our uh, conference coming up. Uh, the system has kind of came together. There was a work group of about 30 plus organizations that met and just talked about the different needs of the community, what types of features we need to have, what are the things that uh, we should be focusing on. And that's really what this, this, this group of stakeholders did. And they helped us define what that RFP is gonna look like and really helped set the stage for what we were looking for. Uh, and ultimately, now how it ended up being the system of choice. Um, Tad covered the whole person care initiative, so I won't get into this too much other than to say, was really amazing about Access supporting this is because they are supporting this for all of Arizona. So we're talking about not just people that are enrolled in Access, but anyone can, can adopt this. And we've already worked, uh, we're already working with uh, school districts, community colleges, uh, parole officers, um, justice clinics. So we're looking, thinking way outside the box in terms of who can adopt the system. And it's not, we're not looking at it just as a Medicaid or Access system. So this, as part of this whole person care initiative, they're really trying to support the entire state of Arizona, which is amazing. And so what are our goals? What are we trying to accomplish here? We have three main goals. The first one uh, really gets to a lot of what Tad was talking about, and that was connecting our communities. So we, we have, we, we do a lot of good work, especially on the behavioral health side of capturing SDOH data. Um, you know, where I think there's been a lot of improvements on probably the primary care side in capturing that data. Uh, but then what do you do with it, right? So you identify someone has a housing need, you know, maybe you have certain resources that you're typically using, um, but do you have a full spectrum of resources to address all the unique needs of people? So what the system is aimed at doing is bringing in all those two-on-one resources, all those organizations that are interested in adopting the platform so that when you, when you provide this to a primary care practice and they do their SDOH screening, it's going to reveal all the resources that are conveniently located for that person. So you're giving them a greater advantage of when they identify a need, they actually have something at their fingertips where they can find how to get that need addressed, whether that be their office staff or the physician themselves, but you can, we can give them a greater look into that, those types of services. The other goal is improving health outcomes with that whole person care mindset. So really uh, thinking of social determinants of health and how we know research shows that they are significantly greater, have a significant impact on someone's overall health a lot of times much more than our physical health care or mental health care. So the idea here is if we can create a system where when these needs are addressed, we're able to get that person connected to a resource that they're eligible for, that's convenient for them, that works for them, and it's simple, that by doing that, we can help it decrease some of these challenges that people have. And then it gives people the ability to engage more in proactive health care. Uh, we can hopefully see things like decrease in emergency department visits or a decrease in, in inpatient uh, occurrences because we're able to have a better connection to these social resources that keep people safe, housed, fed, things like that. Um, and then there's a data-driven approach. So the system does have a lot of really good data, sort of out-of-the-box data. And I have a slide at the end here. I'm going to talk about some of the different like population data and things to think about. Um, but even just from a workflow standpoint, if you're capturing something like a Z code in a record or an assessment, what this system would do is if you're using the referral system workflow, when you do that screening, it's not just going to give you a Z code and then ask you to figure out what to do with it. It's going to give you instead a list of here's all the things you can do to address everything you just identified. So you identify they weren't safe, they needed housing, they needed utilities, clothing. You're not going to just get a bunch of Z codes. That'll be there. We can pull that into the background or put that into your system. Um, but what you want to see is what are the resources that can connect them to. And so now you're really getting a tangible thing on top of the data in the background. So uh, I talked earlier about bringing on all those 211 resources. And so where that comes into play 
the system has two types of referrals that it can do. Uh, one is shared referrals and one is sort of a closed loop or uh, the, the track referral. Now the closed loop is sort of this where we want to get, but shared referrals is also a really great uh, asset to the community. So currently, if we, you log onto that system and you wanted to identify the needs and find resources for a person, it's going to list all those resources. You're not going to have the closed loop where you send a referral and you get that referral feedback, but you can identify the resource and then share it with the person. Um, so this way, it's similar to like if you were to pull something out of your drawer, a piece of paper or a spreadsheet, except it's gonna be much more enhanced. It's going to have, um, you actually can send them a digital card or print if they don't have access to, to those types of uh, technology. Uh, and it'll provide them with directions, eligibility, um, any, any documents they need to bring. And it's gonna be much more up to date because we're working with 2 and with Now Power and Health Current to keep this uh, registry up to date and there's an opportunity for the community to even let us know when something is out of date so we can update it on our end. So now you're gonna have that same experience of being able to identify the resources and give them to, to members, but you'll be able to do it uh, from the system much more uh, efficiently. And the closed loop is basically, we would set up a connection so that when you send a referral for a service, that service provider on the other end has agreed that they're going to provide referral feedback. They're gonna let you know we've accepted the referral, uh, we've scheduled an appointment, and then we can just determine what those types of feedback will be. Um, but those, those are the two types of referrals on the platform. Just to do a, I'm just gonna do a high level review of the features. So the resource directory, I've been talking a lot about that. That is that 211 resource directory, as well as all, any other organizations who adopt the platform. Um, so we'll have uh, like a, uh, nearly 10,000 resources already on there. The social needs screening. So we, we have put in a uh, prepare screening, uh, which is kind of the standard out of the box and just available on the system. It's a little bit modified. We, we reworded the questions a bit to put some uh, safety questions up first, uh, but the, the screening tools can also be, uh, we can create any kind of custom screening you want. We can bring in a screening tool that an organization prefers, uh, or we're, we're even gonna be working on integrations. So those organizations that have their own workflow within their systems and their own screenings within their systems, we could just integrate with that, pull that into the to now how system and make it a much more seamless experience for them. So the screening, uh, op, there's a lot of screening options and we'll be working with each organization on their unique needs. Uh, so you can send those close up referrals or share resources and you can alert and message, which is really, this is a really cool feature too, is that you know right now when you send a referral, Oftentimes it's either a fax or maybe an email and then you can end up playing phone tag or trying to get the person on the phone. It could be, or trying to get a fax over or an email communication responded. Whereas now this message can be sent directly on the platform. So the message you send is in, in, nested in the referral and the responses are nested in the referral. So you have a much more streamlined way of communicating and you can even set it alerts on your computer so that when a, every time a message comes in, you get a notification on your email or you can set it to not do that if you don't want to get all those alerts. Um, and you can even alert the member. So if you set up an appointment, you could send a message to the member saying, hey, you have an appointment today, increase the probability they're gonna show up. And then the analytics. So it comes with sort of a light out of the box um, dashboard, analytics dashboard, and then it has uh, several different uh, sort of standard reporting, but we can also do a full raw data package. So basically every single data point in the entire system, we can pull down that whole data package, provide it to an organization, and they can use it to put into their own business intelligence or combine with their EHR data or what have you. And we will be launching a client portal sometime in 2022. Um, really, we wanted to make sure that the resources are robust and um, well, well spread out throughout the state before we put out a system. So we want to make sure that people do adopt the client or people download the client platform, they're going to get resources near them. Um, so we're thinking probably like spring 2022, but it'll essentially be um, the same thing as a referral system, except clients can, or people, anyone can download it and search for those resources. And it'll be like a Google for social terms of health or healthcare or medical care, any organization who's on the platform. And so I've been talking a lot about different types of data. And here's just some examples of sort of the out of the box data, but you can kind of from a raw data package can think even more broad than, than some of these. Uh, so one is some number of referrals, right? So we have two types, closed loop and shared. You can see, if you're doing closed loop referrals, how many of those did I do? How many shared referrals did, did I do? Um, and if you are an organization who say uh, has, a, has a page on there and your resources are shared, 
you'll see who is sharing your resources. So even if you're not on there making referrals, you're gonna know who is uh, the main organizations that are sending people to you. The average distance people travel to access services, I think this is one of the most interesting metrics because you can see now based on the person's address, not the uh, facility's address, when you send them for housing or whatever the services are, it will aggregate what's the average distance that people are traveling based on their address to get to the service that, the, that that is in. So you can start to see, well, we're sending people for food. Maybe that's 25, 30 miles away consistently for people. Well, maybe we need a more a resource is much more convenient. Maybe that's why we haven't been able to address this particular issue. Um, you can see that for those closed loop uh, referrals, they'll be able to see the metrics, for how much time did it take to respond, how many, which percent were closed. Um, use this to see like what busy, what's your busiest time of day. So what time of day are you getting the most amount of activity? Um, identify who's sending those referrals. I, I, like the, I really like this uh, because if you're say a community-based organization who is on the system, um, but you're not using it uh, for deep data analytics or you're not doing closed loop, you can still log on and see who are the top 10 uh, organizations that are sending, that are sharing my resources, who, who are sending these individuals to us. And that might, be, that might open up a lot of uh, doors to say, well, we might need, need to build a better relationship with this organization because they're sending us a thousand people a month. Um, and you can see the uh, varying volume of services. So organizations have multiple service lines, multiple programs, all that data can be segmented out by service, service line, program, organization, however you're wanting to set that up. And so uh, this is our timeline. Um, and I've talked about this timeline a lot without actually getting to the, the today, which is the official go live day. So we've been working as a, on a pilot over the summer. We did have some challenges um, just kind of getting that up and going mostly because we're trying to create this system where you have healthcare covered entities with community-based organizations that are not covered entities, all playing in the same sandbox, adding no layers of consent, and we want to have a good coordination of care. So figuring that out from a logistical standpoint and a legal standpoint, and a user agreement standpoint was a bit challenging. So it caused a bit of a delay. Uh, I can say though, we have three organizations that are live on the system as of right now, the early adopters. Two of them are doing closed loop referrals, so we're really excited about that. Um, and we're going to be bringing on several more over the next couple of weeks. Uh, and now that we're live, we're reaching out to the community to start to gather information, and we will be starting to onboard uh, the additional organizations that are waiting. We have currently have uh, several that are waiting to, to join. So, and that is it. I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, we have about five minutes for Q&A. Andrew, nice to meet you. Kevin Conway with Sync Health. So, I'm very uh, appreciative of what you're doing at this point. Uh, live to prepare as an assessment tool, but the same thing we're doing is also an SCMP. Uh, but do you want to talk a little about the draft process? I'm not sure if you're going to present the draft process, especially when it comes to the DHA platform, you know, looking at how all things are going on here. So um, I, I am, we're familiar with the Gravity Project and we've been, uh, we've attended some, some of the meetings with our connections to the Human Services Collaborative, um, this a meeting that we have here. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a whole lot to report on that at this time because a lot of what we're working with now is really just trying to set up uh, the community and get, the goal at this time is to get community adoption at, to the, at the highest level so that we can start serving people that have like critical needs immediately. And then we're for phase two and, and on, we're gonna be looking at how we add these additional layers of data, additional um, standards around, uh, you know, trying to get more population health type reports and things uh, for, so we can learn about what we're doing here in the community. But we wanna get that good adoption first and then go from there. But we are working to, to try to integrate some of that research.
there and you know, try and get coverage on your employees. Yeah, so that's a great question. And this, what's really cool about this system is it, it thinks it has like, a, I think over 200 subcategories and 20 service categories. And it, they really thought of everything. This, it, we'll, we'll be mapping this to all these resources. So um, if we, if you do, a, if there is a question as part of the pair that identifies if a person doesn't have uh, healthcare. Um, and it will map to resources in the community that can help support people to get to get healthcare. And our goal will be to bring on as many of those resources as we could so that when those things are identified, there's actually a place to send the person. So if you have a provider who makes that determination and they're 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 trying to they want to help, they may not know what to do next, they could at least click on this and send them to experts that can help them. Um, so the Z codes I understand capture information. But as far as the services that are being provided, so these different interventions that you're doing, securing transitional health, or getting them you know, some support information to take them to the right things. Is there a standardized way of tracking those? So I'm thinking like a CPT code. Um, is, do y'all have some way of tracking those interventions so that possibly they could be built for if yeah, necessary? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll take this one here. So there, so one thing again, which you know people find surprising sometimes, actually Arizona has when you think of, especially on the Medicaid side, very rich benefits. Um, and so as a part of those benefits, there are um, specific services, for example, and there's a few, um, for housing support. So um, helping an individual um, obtain, like go out, and because there are some people that, let's say someone with um, chronic schizophrenia, and they never really built the independent living skills to be able to like literally go out and you know have those skills to do applications to look. There's skills, there's actual um, services to help teach those individuals and walk side by side with them to obtain housing to, to do that. And those are billable codes. There's actual so age there's codes. Yeah, there's, there's, there's age codes. Mm -hmm. Employment is another one. So mm -hmm. helping an individual obtain and, main, and maintain, there's um, billable um, codes for that. Where there isn't necessarily and this gets to those that are compensatable. So code, things that are compensatable under access and things that are not. So housing, to go out and build like a low income housing unit or apartment complex, that's not a billable service, but that's where we're trying to partner to like say, okay, we need to actual build low income housing. So how are we gonna do this? But once people, to get people connected to that house, and then to keep it, there is covered services, sorry. Yeah, and not to take away some of your conversation, but there is a coding structure called ARIES, that two and one unit, that's a taxonomy to identify. So it doesn't translate to an ICD-10 billing world, or CPT billing world, that you look at. But there is a coding structure, two and one unit, that at a higher level, it builds its intelligence system, that builds its sense of housing system, including security, transportation, um, uh, isolation. I've never seen it used outside too much once. I was kind of surprised for us when we started going into it. Um, and we haven't found a way to translate it to Z code or, or other things. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. But it is out there. Yeah. And it's, it's nice to know it does exist. Yeah. Sure. I just had a quick question. You know, thinking about everything that Mercy Care and Health Current is seeing with SDH. And the recent development in the last, I'd say, year and a half with some local paramedics that are being trained more along the lines of that like, field paramedic. Yeah. Okay. Is there the connection of data between some of those programs with what both of you are supporting the community? Well, with? I can talk on our end, but I'll let you on the help on the kind of close loop. Yeah, um, so as an HIE, we do a lot of uh, work with PMS, uh, but we are also looking at how we can work with them on SDOH. So if they're out there in the community and they identify a need, um, they can connect them right there on their phone. Uh, however, we've heard, we've got feedback that it's a bit challenging uh, to do that, and they need something very simple. So we're looking into ways where uh, there's actually a, a research project that's happening now. We're looking at 
potentially connecting with that to make a much simpler uh, view for just EMS. Yes. So that's one of the things that we're, we're exploring with our with our system. Um, but then I'll yeah. So. And then we have um, some specific partnerships that we've done created over the years with first responders in general. So there is definitely the fire side, but there's also the law enforcement side. So I'm creating some programs to help those like officers or fire um, connect individuals to actual navigators and not navigators for us. We actually can have them bill for that and, and, uh, and then we'll pay, pay for it to just help them because the biggest part for fire and law enforcement is for them to get on and get off and be ready and available. This kind of stuff weighs them down and they're the first ones to say it and say it like, give me a remedy, give me a solution, give me out. Um, and so we really try to kind of look at that. Um, that does play into some of the other things like behavioral health with us being the regional behavioral health authority. Their biggest issue is I keep going out to this house and clearly they're struggling with bipolar disorder or something. What can we do? And so we've kind of tied a lot of that into that work to really help support them to, you know, want to train them on how to properly respond, you know, and then to get them out too. And so, um, so we've done quite a bit of work around that. There's a ton of municipal, that ton of cities. Um, so we've, we've worked with a lot. We still have more to do with, with some of the other cities, but the larger ones, um, Mesa, Tempe, um, Phoenix in particular, Surprise, we've done a lot of work to try to help connect and work within the culture that, that they operate under to really really address some of these issues. Yeah. Has the has the pandemic been an accelerator change? Definitely, definitely. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know we were hounding Andrew and Michael. We're like, we want to be an early adopter because we're seeing all these issues. <laughs> so I was like, keep calling and keep calling them. And so he says yes. <laughs> I want to make a comment that we, like, I teach on informatics. I teach about the, the access plan, the metrics module about them. Uh, this is a program that goes all in the United States and it's an international program. And the comment from my students is Arizona, we are like about other access programs and how, and one of our, uh, oh, the other assignment is about the exchange, exchange. And we have one of the best exchanges in the United States, comparatively speaking to the rest of the United States. The other places, and that we are. Yeah. And you know, the Health Information Exchange was a big push by access to do. I mean, that was a big yes. driver. So, and you know, we have some pretty nationally recognized, we've had nationally recognized leaders that in access and rightfully so they really stepped up and really said, what, a, what do we need here? And have really pushed for that. So, I think we have a lot. I know I'm very thankful to be here in, in Arizona because of the content. Yeah. Thank you both. Okay. Thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. We have so this is our break for lunch. So you know, please make your way out to the courtyard and grab your favorite snacks, and we'll resume the trust sessions this afternoon. Thank you.